What is it you want, Barry? What do you want? You, you want the moon? Just say the word and I'll throw a lasso around it and pull it down. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, dying times here. Come with me if you want to live. That's it, man. Game over, man. Game over. The Force will be with you. Always. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to 20th Century Geek. I'm your regular host, Scott Weatherly, and the interviews continue. In the last episode, we had a couple of interviews. We had Paul Cornell and Stephen Volk talking around five key questions I had around the horror genre and how it changed over time from the 20th century up to present day. Well, they've got a whole bunch of those interviews. Uh, They are sort of like the raw interviews. I think they're important. I was going to put them into some sort of documentary format, didn't quite get it to work, uh, but the interviews are so good that I want to put them out. So this is part two. There's going to be part three coming out in two weeks after this is going to be the final part. But this one is a single interview. It's quite a long one. Uh, it's me talking with author uh, Grady Hendrix. And Grady's a really great guy. Uh, wrote the uh, phenomenal uh, Paperbacks from Hell, which is a chronicling of horror paperbacks from sort of like how they sort of took off in the sort of 60s and 70s and into the 80s, all the lurid covers and all that kind of stuff. High recommend for anyone that wants to know their horror history. Uh, but also a fiction writer wrote a book called Horror Store about a uh, a demon-possessed furniture shop, which I haven't read yet, but then also my best friend's Exorcism, which is really good, actually. Uh, set in the late 80s, and it's about two... Uh, young girls or well girls high school girls one of whom becomes possessed by a demon and um it's yeah it's a bit kitschy as it should be because of the 80s but the horror in it is real the climax i felt that book is absolutely brilliant so uh recommend checking those out as well but grady knows his stuff like the man knows his horror and he knows his history and his genre of fiction so it was a great chat with him um and so i will now hand over to grady and myself talking and uh, then the rest of the interviews will come in time. Hope you enjoy. Um, we'll start with the first one. So the first one is evolution and acceptance of horror as a mainstream genre. Um, so the first question is, has it become accepted? Or do you think it has become accepted as a bit of a mainstream genre? Well, the problem with talking about horror, I think, is you wind up talking about marketing more than anything, mm-hmm. because horror is just a genre category, right? So uh, in films, say, horror may mean something radically different than it does in publishing. Um, so I think, you know, horror films, I think you'd have to say they're mainstream. I mean, Rosemary's Baby in 67, Alfred Hitchcock's entire career, um, you know, The Exorcist, on and on and on. I mean, a, a lot of the great classics are, are horror movies. I mean, Silence of the Lambs won, what, eight Academy Awards? I think horror is seen as very um, valid as an art form in film, and I think it's seen as um, very lucrative. In publishing, it's a different story. Uh, I think horror comes and it goes in terms of popularity. Um, in television, it's it's always been pretty popular. Um, and, and, and as a genre in general, I mean good lord like you know go back to jacobean revenge tragedies and things i mean you know they weren't called horror although people use that word but they were they were enormously popular so i really think the idea of horror sort of not being popular it depends on what what form of your what we what medium you're talking about more than anything um so in terms of right now, yeah, horror is enormously popular and enormously <laughs> lucrative. I mean, every everyone with a graduate degree has to let you know how much they love Get Out and what it really means and how Us is a masterpiece. Like, that just goes without saying. <clears throat> yeah, what do they call it? Sort of elevated horror. Um, you know, yeah, I think I've... Uh, I enjoy them, you know, I think Get Out's quite a good film. I enjoy Hereditary. But, but the term and... elevated horror... The term elevated horror is so weird to me. I mean, Edith yeah. Morton wrote ghost stories. Henry James wrote a lot of ghost stories. Like, you know, I mean, the, the, the horror has been, you know, Shirley Jackson's one of the most important novelists of the 20th century. So's Toni Morrison. Two of their greatest books are haunted house books. I mean, I, I don't know what the elevated horror thing means, except it's kind of a, a phrase that critics have used recently to distinguish between um, horror they like and horror they don't like. 
<laughs> well, I was going to say because when I say it, I do say it with inverted commas because it is it's that thing of it's just it's a tag that's been given, hasn't it? But um, when I watch some of the films, um, you know, uh, like uh, Midsummer or like the Hereditary, sort of the Ali Aster ones, or Get Out, and some of the others, <clears throat> I do think there's been, like you say, there have been stories, there have been books. As you say, sort of um, Shirley Jackson's um, you know, The Haunting of Hill House, as you say, um, is is a slow burn psychological horror. Like it's all been done before. Um, I suppose just because it's right. translated to film now, I suppose it, it it channels into that wider audience, and so it requires a um, requires a, a tag um, so it can be discussed. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, you know, it's funny. Like you look at something like Ari Aster's Midsummer, which um, I didn't really. You know, I think is I think has been done before is the Wicker Man, and you look at how self consciously it deploys sort of like art house tropes, right? Mm-hmm. The way it's shot, the way it's edited, the way it's art decorated, um, and the way it's art. You know, the art department works and the production design works, and, and just how self conscious all of that is, as opposed to something like um, the original The Wicker Man which I think is a, a much more interesting movie and is much less self-conscious and is willing to look goofy in ways that, um, you know, would be fatal to Midsummer. I mean, when I saw Hereditary, which is a movie I like a lot, I mean, it's got some things I don't love about it, but I liked Hereditary a lot. Um, when it got to the end and there was the moment where the kid sort of does a Homer Simpson out the attic window after he sees the naked smiling people, mm. I burst out laughing because, and, and, and A, because it was such a perfect face plant into a flower bed, but B, because the movie had been so relentlessly ominous and serious up until that moment it hadn't given me anywhere to release that tension and so the second something happened i obviously overreacted um much to the un- unhappiness of the people sitting around me but Be- because it was just so serious that the second anything absurd intruded it 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 destroyed the moment uh, <clears throat> i do know what you mean i, and I agree in that sense of you know there's a fine line between sort of horror and comedy as they say and they, they actually are quite interwoven um and you know i think absurdity especially you know absurdist humor that thing seems to fit so well with horror that when it's absent it's sort of it's it's almost glaring in its absence at the time when, when there's I, I i find horror films without without humor sort of to say to be more bland um yeah <clears throat> sure I mean, you know, look, I mean, the Blair Witch Project wouldn't be the Blair Witch Project if we didn't have 20, 25 minutes of kids we recognize bumbling around in the woods and being kind of like um, likable and relatably lost before, you know, people's teeth start getting yanked out by a witch. Yeah, relatable. Because it's funny, actually, we'll get back onto topic in a bit. But, but, um, yeah, sorry. So it's, it's, it's all good stuff. Um Someone said, to, oh, there's always a phrase, and someone actually repeats it to me when I sort of remind him about these things, is <clears throat> life, not, not not everyone's a comedian, but everyone's funny. Life is funny. You know, sure. so, so, you know, when, when they have these like mellow, melodramas or these sort of like really sort of, you know, um, cynical dramas with no humour in, you sort of think, well, it, it feels more absurd and more ridiculous than sort of like some comedies. Because you're like, well, no, people are funny and they will laugh in the face of horror and. and you know, and yeah. um, so to remove no, it sort of feels a bit daft, a bit weird. Yeah, I mean, you know, you look at the original Haunting, uh, the Robert Wise adaptation in, I think, 1960 of Shirley Jackson's Haunting of Hill House. And that's a movie that's relentlessly grim and humorless. But it's also a movie that's entirely from Eleanor's point of view, and her point of view is humorless. So you see that, you know, it's got the voiceover, it's got that really subjective camera work. And so you see characters reacting to Eleanor and sort of rolling their eyes at her, but the audience is forced to be Eleanor. So it's able to sustain that kind of humorless, ominous tone throughout. But usually, yeah, a movie, you know, that's about life, at least the way I see life, like you said, it's absurd and then horrible things happen kind of out of nowhere yeah yeah um to move to the next question sort of about it being accepted and, and sort of you know you said in, in uh, ebbs and flows really i think but to, do, do you think that sort of it, it, it changes with society or that society sort of changes to accept it more based on what's happening in the wider world 
I don't know, because, I mean, it would be really easy to pick, to cherry pick some things that happened in the wider world and then to cherry pick some examples of pop culture and to sort of say, look, these, you know, this came from this or this caused this or this inspired this. And I'm not sure it works that way or I'm not sure I know enough to see if it works that way or not. But, you know, I do see trends in pop culture and in pieces of pop culture. And so definitely, you know, there is this thing that I've seen um in the 70s, you know, you had uh, – I, I write a lot about publishing and, and horror publishing history. So in the 70s, you had this really serious take on horror, and there was absurd stuff. I mean, let's not forget that, you know, I think 1969, 1968 was when The Little People came out, John Christopher's novel about um, Nazi leprechauns and an <laughs> Irish bed and breakfast. Mm -hmm. um, but – you also had, I mean, the majority of what represented horror were really grim, really serious books like Rosemary's Baby and The Exorcist and Thomas Tryon's Harvest Home. And, um, you know, you had movies like um, The Sentinel and, uh, you know, the, the tone was very serious. It was adults grappling with these issues of faith and what's happening to their children and all this stuff. I mean, you know, you had movies like Last House on the Left and um, – you know, and then you sort of got to the end of the 70s, and I'm not sure if, if producers realized it or what happened, but horror started becoming aimed more at young people. Um, you certainly, you know, you had the slasher trend where suddenly horror is happening exclusively to the young people, and there aren't really, it's like a Peanuts cartoon. There aren't really many adults on screen. Um, you can sort of like, you know, there's three adults. One of them's going to be the killer. Um, and you get into this thing in the 80s where horror got more and more fun, especially in movies, but also in pop culture, it got kind of wilder and more over the top. I mean, there's a world of difference between um, The Exorcist and, you know, with a, with a young girl possessed by a demon who's stabbing herself in her, her crotch with a crucifix until it bleeds and then smearing her mother's face in it. There's a world of difference between that and Jack Chick's car cartoon, Dark Dungeons, uh, his tract in the 80s about how Dungeons and Dragons will cause you to, you know, do witchcraft and hang yourself when your character, you know, dies and you got tunnels and trolls with Tom mazes and monsters with Tom Hanks threatening to jump off the world trade center and all this really over the top stuff and this kind of attitude of camp towards it. And then that all sort of, sort of changed in the late eighties because serial killers came in and horror publishing was in this race to capture reader eyes. And they really wanted these covers that were more and more over the top. And everyone wanted to do serial killers because Thomas Harris's um, Red Dragon and then Silence of the Lambs has been such big hits. And then you had 91 where Silence of the Lambs wins all these Oscars and suddenly everything serial killers all the time. And it's you've got the splatterpunk movement really feeding into things at that time and pushing back on the, the moral majority and the religious right. And so you have these really, really gory serial killer books with lots of women being raped and murdered uh, with these really over the top covers. And there's just so many of them being published and there's not a lot of quality control. And it kind of flames out by 95. And there's this idea that horror died in the 90s. But what I really see happening is actually there were lots of people who were into horror, but the horror they were into was Buffy the Vampire Slayer and The X-Files and Supernatural and Millennium. And that generation growing up on those shows and, and you know there were the movies like Scream, which was very meta and the faculty and things, but that generation – came to realize that horror wasn't just gore and murder and darkness, but it could also be used to show romance. It could also be funny. It could have friendship, conspiracies, or bigger things than just what was traditionally associated with horror. And I find that a lot of those people who grew up on that kind of 90s horror are people in sort of decision-making roles now, and they're also people who are producing stuff now, and they're also people who are consuming stuff now. And so you find that sensibility that horror can do a lot more than just scare you or be dark or be gory. You see that a lot more now than you have in the past, and I think that's directly because the generation – consuming, making, and greenlighting pop culture right now grew up on the horror of the 90s. Oh, yeah, I'd agree with that. Uh, when you say all that, I mean, Jason Blum, you know, in Blumhouse comes to mind um, sort of straight away, really. I mean, you know, he, he sort of, he's managing to sort of greenlight such a variety um, 
of horror and stuff that you know it's 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 clear that he's you know, those influences are definitely there in some of the stuff he's a- angling for. So that's a really good point. Um, go on. No, 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 go for uh, it. Uh, so really, so the, the the next question is sort of um, I'll read the question, but I think we'll might change it a little bit. What has had the biggest impact on the changing face of genre acceptance? But really, sort of all the things you've sort of said there. But what would be the biggest influence on all those changes? The thing that sort of has impacted horror in you know the most over the twentieth century, really. Oh, over the twentieth century, World War One, hundred percent World War One. Um, you know, you look at um, you look at what was allowed on screen and in fiction before World War One and after World War One, and you have a huge fragmenting in popular culture. You have literature embracing modernism after World War One. You have film embracing sort of images of the grotesque and um, these sort of morbid death obsessed images um, in movies like Nosferatu and um, Vampire and even the Universal horror movies, uh, many of which were were made and starred. World War One veterans. Uh, you have a public that have been exposed to not just images, but people they know being blown apart on the battlefield and coming back traumatized and, and wounded and scarred. Um, I think World War One had an enormous impact. It really and it really destroyed the idea in literature and I think even music and even uh, visual art that there was one narrative. Right, like when you look at say. I don't know, 19th century novelist, you feel this real, um, this idea that there's a point of view that is the point of view, whether it's a chatty narrator like Dickens, or whether it's a sort of omnipresent narrator like George Eliot in Middlemarch, um, or it's, um, you know, it's someone like Henry James with this sort of like, you know, rabbinical beard tugging, convoluted journeys into the heart of a human being. And you have this radical fracturing of that with authors like Virginia Woolf and James Joyce and Samuel Beckett, who are questioning even what a narrator is, what a point of view is, if you can have one point of view, if if there is even such a thing as a point of view. So, I mean, World War One just radically reshaped. Um, modern culture and i think it really reshaped what was acceptable in horror um you had people who suddenly i mean you know there were battles in world war one where seven thousand horses died in a day where twenty thousand men died in a couple of days um it's insane the death toll and and sort of the stamp it put on humanity and you see that i think in movies all through the 20s all through the 30s and and even into the 40s and really that strain of sort of like almost um almost unsavory darkness it it flows right on up through psycho and and that flowers again at the end of the 60s with um you know rosemary's baby and the exorcist and thomas tryon's the other sort of bringing this new wave of horror to movies and um and and books that's a really good point i've never thought of that and but you know, I mean, I know World of One has a has a, has a, has a massive social impact, um, but I hadn't really applied it to to uh, you know the the culture in that way. Um, well, you look at you know all those German expressionists, right? Yeah, the country had just been destroyed by World War One. They had yeah. served. They had been harrowed by it. The surrealists. I mean, um, you know, you look at James Whale. You look at um, Murnau. All these people had been in World War One, or and affected by it personally. So I think you can see them bringing that. Um, there's a great book by Scott Poole called Wasteland that's about this. I mean, it's about World War One and its impact on popular culture. And it really made me rethink a lot of things um, in terms of what we're doing now and where that comes from. Uh, and one of the things that's really interesting that he talks about is, you know, James Whale, who directed Frankenstein and, and Bride of Frankenstein, uh, he really um and i just want to actually i want to make sure i'm saying something accurate because i'm sure you're editing this so <laughs> i just want to like make sure i'm not talking myself into a hole i just want to check a date on this yeah, yeah. um yeah yeah okay yeah so james whale who directed frankenstein and bride of frankenstein you know he was in world war one and he was enormously traumatized by what had happened to him and the original ending of frankenstein is the monster throwing 
Dr. Frankenstein's body off the windmill and it just hits one of the blades and, and he's dead and the villagers are surround him and the windmill explodes and collapses and the last shot was everyone buried by rubble and dead and there is no music on the soundtrack and there's just the sound of wind and rain and that was the end of the movie and when the people you know when the when the studio saw that they were like uh, no, no, no 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 we're gonna have a quick romantic thing dr frankenstein survived it's all okay and roll music roll credits like you know roll the end um but that kind of bleakness i think was something that a lot of people came out of world war one really wanting to express it's like you said a minute ago that um you may not be a funny person but life is funny mm-hmm. you know and i think for you know who we are is shaped by what we go through and i think these guys went through something that left its fingerprints on them for the rest of their lives and they were the source of motion picture horror in this century yeah no i mean you know i'm thinking also like of, of todd browning's freaks um yeah <clears throat> um and there's, there's a character in that that uh, um the the clown who obviously you know he, he's lost <laughs> part of him um you know and it sort of alluded to that sort of meant to have been from due to the war and stuff so yeah well i mean the famous the famous line by ronald reagan in king king's row i think where's the rest of me yeah. he wakes <laughs> up in bed with his legs amputated i mean you know and i think it's interesting like look at lon cheney and how famous he become twisting his body into all these shapes and in the meantime people were walking out on the street and seeing you know people begging and panhandling walking around who had their faces blown apart and put back together whose arms and legs were missing um i mean i think it was just this enormous part of of the collective consciousness. Yeah, the real weight was have held up, hung over them for that for that period and Yeah. You know, it's interesting you look at how much it's something Scott talks about in his book and it's something you really see when you look at a lot of the surrealist artists and people like Otto Dix and things and you look at their art of World War One with people in gas masks with these goggle eyes and these weird insectoid faces and these cadavers and, you know, these emaciated corpses and um, these torn up wastelands of mud and barbed wire and bones and carnage. And you just can draw a line from that to so much horror movie imagery today. Yeah, I suppose I suppose you know that that sort of dehumanization. It's it's a, it's, a, it's something I'm looking at elsewhere actually. But like the you know this thing of dehumanizing um, the villain um, in horror, sort of, you know, especially behind masks. Yeah. And I think of like you know the the obvious two being sort of Jason Voorhees and and you know Michael Myers. But then there's so many, aren't there, that sort of have that that that, that, hum- that way of dehumanizing them, that remo- removing the facial features. You know, makes them yeah. the other. Uh, and I suppose you're right. It does go back to that idea of, um, you know, you say that that imagery. I could imagine that being a real influence over and, and just sticking in their social consciousness and staying with us for, for decades. Yeah, and you know, one thing that's interesting, and I don't really agree with it. Uh, Scott makes a lot in in Wasteland about out of the idea that this horror of dolls faces and mannequins faces and sort of like, you know, like you're saying masks Mm. is because we identify that empty unmoving face with a corpse. And that comes out of world war one. And I'm not sure I agree with that. I think there's always been a fear, this sort of automata automatonophobia of things that look human, but aren't human, you know, a fear of statues, a fear of mannequins, a fear of dolls, a fear of puppets. There's something really unnerving about seeing something that's human but it's not human you don't know Mm. how it's going to act or what it's going to do i mean there's that great moment in mimic right with um the guillermo del toro movie where um i think it's mia sorvino Mm. is on the subway platform and she sees the guy and he turns out to be a bug and it's just this great moment where something that looks human is not human and there's such just a primal fear i'm not sure you can boil it down past that and assign it to some other thing beyond it's terrifying to think something's human and it's not yeah i think because i think you could go back further than that because i suppose I'm, I, you know, I can't think of examples at the moment but if you were to go back to sort of some some victorian gothic horror and oh yeah you could definitely no, and i think we're i think i agree with you i'm saying i think it's such a primal fear yeah. you can't assign it to world war one or this or that mistaking something for human when it's not human is i think 
just one of those primal fears that probably goes back to to, to our origins as, as people. Yeah, yeah, as like I say, just seeing things in the shadows or, you know, like I say, yeah, when, it, when you're a caveman, your survival comes down to identifying exactly what's around you. If you can't, then you're fully right to be scared of it, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> okay. I'm not, yeah, I'm really going to think about that World War One. That's a really good, some really good points there. Um, it sort of does bleed into the next question really well, actually. And, and um, I mean, the next question is: Does genre fiction act as then as a catharsis and a mirror for social fears? I don't know if it's a catharsis. You know, I, I'm not. I people use that a lot, and I'm not sure what they mean because like if i because i come at horror from a very i like it i come at horror from a point of view where i find it comforting and enjoyable i like the gravestones i like the cobwebs i like spiders those i don't when people say this book does this book scare you i don't know what they're talking about because books don't scare me um being broke scares me not knowing Mm. how to pay my bills scares me my wife getting sick and not knowing what she has scares me um a a book about like a killer cat that doesn't scare me um but i enjoy it immensely so i'm not sure i can speak to the catharsis but i definitely think that pop culture always mirrors the world around us you know um you look at the way that it you know took horror a while to catch up with the 60s um you know in in america at least you had this horror i mean it was the late 60s well after the civil rights movement and all that violence that came with that well after the beginning of the free speech movement and all the violence that came with that well well after the huge violence with the labor movements uh in the u.s and and strike breaking and all that i mean horror was like the late 60s before it started getting serious you know and i really think that's rosemary's baby uh even in movies it was sort of hammer vampire films and um uh sort of roger corman aip edgar Allan poe period pieces horror happened to remove and it had velvet collars and it had a real formality to it um and then suddenly you had rosemary's baby and that was such a success and i think that point in 67 that really captured something in the pop culture that was had been boiling and hadn't been expressed in film or books or film or horror movies or horror books i mean you had it in film with movies like bonnie and clyde and that kind of thing you had it in books with things like port noise complaint and valley of the dolls and the james bond books you had it in spaghetti westerns you had it in japanese samurai movies but you didn't have it in horror movies and you didn't have it in horror fiction and i think that just took a long time to catch up um you know, so, but yeah, definitely you can see pop culture being reflected in, in horror, 100%, just like you can see pop culture being reflected in musicals or westerns. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, you know, you, you mentioned sort of Rosemary's Baby, and <clears throat> I'm really sort of interested to think what you think about this is, um, I, think, I think you might have mentioned it in, in, in your book, actually, that the idea of sort of like burnt offerings, um, and then obviously things like uh, the um, Amityville Horror, um, you know, sort of re- reaching back into your home, you know, before, let's say, a lot of it had been, um, you know, as you said, removed. It sort of it was in a, a castle far, far away, or a Victorian manor, or something like that. Um, and I think really, it's sort of it's it's funny. I sort of <clears throat> I think of, of the Amityville Horror being the real sort of turning point because it was claimed to be, you know, real. Um, Jensen Hansen obviously wrote the book to as a. a, a an account uh, of, of what had happened um, and then the film came out but really the thing that took off from that it's, really, it's not until Poltergeist really when it's sort of like you know and the Toby Hooper Spielberg sort of effect um, when I think it really starts to take hold and sort of horror sort of st- to get its claws into like modern day mm-hmm. um, right yeah well you know it's interesting right like I don't think these authors do it consciously. They don't look, sit down and say, well, what's going on in pop culture and how shall I reflect that in my fiction? I mean, that would be giving like Jay Anson and Amityville Horror way too much credit. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think that what's going on around kind of influences you because you want to write something that people react to and you take on board what you see people reacting to. Um, look at the fact that 
suddenly in the late 70s and the early 80s there was all this catholic horror fiction about like evil priests and you know possessed popes and all this stuff and you you look at that and then you look at all the press john paul ii was getting when he uh i think it's he ascended to the, I, the papacy i'm not sure what exactly it's called he was enthroned um but uh you look at the, the fact that the first non-Italian pope had just come into office after some really convulsive stuff in the Catholic Church that had made headlines everywhere, and that John Paul II was a rock star who was going on this world tour, who went to the Soviet Union where tens of thousands of people defied official orders and lined the streets to see him in Poland. You know, I mean, you look at that. And then you look at suddenly this huge outcropping over a course of about four or five years of Catholic horror novels, and you think, come on, there must be, you know, that, that doesn't happen at random. You know, you didn't see all those Catholic horror novels in 1961. You saw them after John Paul II became Pope, or around the time he was. So I don't think it's a conscious choice on the author's part, but I think we write about the world around us. And so if something's going on in the world, it kind of worms its way into your writing. No, yeah, it's a good point. I mean, it's interesting that, um, you know, as I think you, you've done it with, with your, you know, my best friend's exorcism and, and um, what was the one I recently read? Head Full of Ghosts and um, books are, books about exorcism sort of are on the increase. Um, oh, good. Yeah. I, I really enjoy. And it seems to me that I, I spoke to uh, P- Peter Laws uh, recently um uh about this for for this and he writes sort of like crime horror um but he's he's also a reverend and he was saying he was saying to me well actually you know uh exorcism and possessions are actually on the increase like you know it, it's it's shown they're not in the hundreds anymore that like they are you know they're virgin on the hundreds into the thousands of people you know requesting them every every year um right. and so it's clearly but sort I think, of yeah no, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, yeah. So saying, like, like as you say, it's sort of like there's clearly something in the air, or something that sort of, you know, is it, you know, what's influencing these people, and what's influencing, you know, I say yourself, whatever, uh, when they write the books. Yeah, but it's also, you know, some of it is accidental, right? Like, so when I did my best friend's exorcism, a lot of people like, oh, it's part of that wave of like '80s throwback nostalgia. And listen, man, it, you know, I, I was, I was annoyed and overjoyed when Stranger Things came out, <laughs> real close to like my best friend's exorcism, and and um, a lot of other things like that. But I'll tell you. The reason my best friend's exorcism set in the eighties is because I had to, I sold my publisher the title and I didn't have a book to go with it. And so I was like, okay, I know that this is about like, I want, I knew that it was going to be about exorcism and what was something you know, we're, we're living in a much less religious time where people take religious faith less seriously. So what's something that people would have faith in? Cause exorcisms are about faith. What's something that people would have faith in as much as they, they did in religion. I thought, oh, you're friends. Okay, well, I need to set this, like, so, because it's my best friend. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. So I need to set this when your friendship's going to be the strongest, and that would be high school. I think everyone's most intense friendships probably happen in high school. I know mine did. So I was like, okay, well, I can't write about contemporary high school. I don't understand a high school where people are vaping and they're standardized testing everywhere, and, you know, instead of English, you have language arts, and long division happens in this weird way with a grid that I don't understand. I don't get it. So I got to set it in my high school. And I looked back through all my old yearbooks. And, and you know, people write in the, the cover like, hey, have a great summer and all this. And I noticed that 10th grade was when those inscriptions and in yearbooks from your friends went from it was cool to sit next to you in algebra to these long essays full of inside jokes. And I thought, OK, something happens in 10th grade where you really develop these friendships and these intense things with inside jokes and references and this almost like a private world with your friends. And my 10th grade experience was 1988. So I was like, okay, 1988. And so, you know, and already when I wrote that, I was definitely aware because I, I used to do a film festival. And and so I'm pretty familiar with the film festival circuit and what's out there. And I was already aware that there were a lot of movies on the film festival circuit, low budget horror movies and, and some sort of coming of age indie films that really had a lot of nostalgia for the eighties. They had very John Carpenter, heavy synth scores and, you know, high key. And I was like, okay, I know that's happening, but, but this is different. This is books. And, but by the time I was done with it, you know, that was happening everywhere. So did I ride a wave? Was it accidental? Did I help cause a wave? Like, I don't know. So there's an element where it's not conscious, but I think there's, 
you know, it, it's definitely possible all that stuff got subconsciously influenced me. Cool. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. So, <laughs> I just. Oh, thanks. Um. Okay, so let's just move on to representation in genre fiction. So, um, this one, this one has been a bit contentious actually with with the, with the previous sort of. Um, oh really? Yeah, in, in a weird way. So it's been quite interesting. So. I ask, has genre fiction been at the forefront of representation in fiction? And I suppose that sort of means in any any way. So it could be race, uh, religion, uh, gender, all those kinds of things, sexuality. So do you think that genre fiction uh, has been at the forefront of representation in fiction? Huh, that's interesting because... Hmm. Well, okay, so a couple of things. One is, because um, there's always a couple of things with me, I can't ever shut up. Um, but one of the things is, you know, I always think of horror as more of a woman genre. I know there's this idea that horror's a, a boys' club, but I look at, like, you know, the first horror novel that's still read today is Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Anne Radcliffe was one of the most famous authors of the 18th and, and early 19th century and who wrote these gothic horror novels. You look throughout the 19th century, and there's Charlotte Riddell, there's Vernon Lee, there's all these women who are enormously popular short stories and and novel writers who wrote ghost stories and ghost fiction um and then you get into the 20th century and the only book the only horror novel that made sort of the bestseller list and was a big commercial hit before rosemary's baby was um, daphne de Maurier's rebecca from i think 1938 and so you know and i and i really will always say and i will i will make this argument and if people can argue with me but they're wrong but the two great horror novels of the 20th century are tony morrison's beloved and shirley jackson's haunting of hill house and so i you know and and i know there's a thing with stephen king in the 80s and he really did dominate the 80s but right next to him were ann rice and vc andrews um I think what happens is that women get written out of the narrative. So, you know, you look at King, who was enormously prolific. He was a book a year author, and he has been producing a book a year for 40 years, I think, which is an enormous feat. And, and you know, it really overshadows people like V.C. Andrews, who passed away after seven books, and, and a dude took over as ghostwriter on her novels under her name. Or Anne Rice, who wrote her vampire books and some of her witch books, but then lost her interest in horror and wrote these Christian historical um, novels. And so... I mean, you compare anyone to Stephen King and he just eats them alive because he's A, so prolific and B, so inventive. Um, but I really feel like women kind of get written out of the story. I mean, Joan Sampson's Auctioneer was an enormous hit when it came out in the 70s. Unfortunately, she died of brain cancer three weeks later, so she never had a follow up. Um, and so I feel like women just sort of got written out a little bit. Um and, I, and one thing I've, I've been really happy to see is how many women are writing horror these days, because I feel like it's kind of I feel like a freeloader in, in their genre. Um, but I also think with diversity, there are things that are structural that really make it hard uh, and, and that shape it. So you look at publishing right now and publishing is an industry that's enormously dominated by women. I think it's like 77% of publishing industry jobs in the U S are held by women, which, Hey, it's great, man. They dominate an industry. That's fantastic. And so obviously, you know, they do reach out a lot to female authors. Um, publishing is really trying hard right now in general to bring in more diverse voices gay voices or you know lesbian voices trans voices people of color all that which i think is fantastic and you see that in horror also which is great um in movies you see less women making movie like making horror movies because there's less women making movies film since probably since people i mean when the film industry started it was huge number of women were directing and producing and writing but as soon as people realized there was a lot of money to be made there dudes started to dominate and that's tended to be the story of motion pictures ever since and so now you see more women getting into movies but it's been an industry dominated by men so of course horror movies have been dominated by guys so i think it largely a lot of it has to do with structural things within publishing and within filmmaking that trickle down to horror publishing and horror filmmaking i know for me I really think, and listen, I'm a white dude, and so, like, for me, the argument for diversity is um, not one that, 
I, it affects me, but I'm not arguing from a place of morality. I'm not, oh, although I think it is a moral thing. I'm not arguing from a place of legality. I'm not arguing from anything else, but I want new stories. And I've read a lot of stories written by white dudes for many, many years. And I want to see, you know, I want to see the Asian American um, werewolf story from Iowa. I want to see the South Asian witchcraft story from Hawaii. I want to see the trans uh, ghost story from North Dakota. I want to see those stories. That's what I want to read because those are new to me and they're exciting. And I want to see what people have to say about that stuff and what they do with these tropes and toys that I love so much. I want new things. I want new stories. And so to me, that's why I want all this stuff because it's a breath of fresh air because, you know, these voices have been silenced for so long. No, uh, yeah, it's a really good point. I mean, just to go back to what you're saying about Anne Rice and stuff, it's, it's, it's an interesting one that <clears throat> it, you know, you mentioned Buffy before, and uh, I was, you know, I was a sort of a teenager in the sort of nineties and, and did come up on like like I said, Buffy and the X Files were huge for me. Um, yeah. But like I say, I didn't read Interview uh, with a Vampire until probably the early two thousands when I was at university, and just reading that, and obviously I've seen the film and stuff, but just reading it, and you think, yeah, everything I've seen, uh, every vampire thing I've seen, really has sort of been influenced by this this sort oh, yeah. of series of books up until now like you know um and it's just fascinating that sort of um she she is known but i would say she's probably less known now than she was then but still her influence is massive you know even today oh, it's so. huge yeah uh, and you know one of the interesting things is you know because you mentioned diversity in terms of sexuality in horror and one of the things that's interesting is horror always sublimates so many things right because horror is about scaring people so sexuality gets sub- sublimated everything gets sublimated but man those those vampire books that Anne Rice wrote, <laughs> there's not much intercourse in them, but they are throbbing with this weird sublimated sexuality that's that's a little bit gay, a little bit straight, a little bit queer, a little bit nor like it's just this weird sort of like really um, polymorphous sexuality that's like if you're straight, you can relate to it. If you're gay, you can relate to it. Probably if you're trans, you can relate to it because it's, it's just the heart of those books and it creeps into every paragraph and sentence of them. No. Yeah. They, they are something I wouldn't mind revisiting those at some point. Cause they, they were, they are good. And it's interesting. I haven't seen anyone do this, but you know, Poppy Z bright was so huge in the early nineties. Also writing, you know, vampire fiction and, and um, serial killer fiction and stuff. And, you know, Poppy Zebrae has transitioned to being a man now, and I haven't seen anyone go back and look at her books again and the way she deals with sexuality, because she's always been very gay-friendly. Um, and to look at the books through the lens of, okay, this was a, a trans person writing these books, and, and what is that? how does that influence how she's writing and how she's addressing these things? I'd be fascinated to read that, because her stuff... You know, her career kind of flamed out largely because of publishing industry stuff. And, um, you know, her publishers got uncomfortable with some of her books and she got, I think, dropped by one of her publishers because of content, which is just so hurtful to an author. But I would, you know, her her books, everyone I knew owned a copy of her books back in the day. Mm, that would be interesting, actually, to sort of see those, yeah, those influences, well, the influences, but the... Uh... Like you say, traces of, of you know her her own sort of sexuality or his sexuality yeah, being, like being in that work, book. How she, yeah, what? How is she working through her identity in her writing? Because you know, ultimately, the big sort of like silhouette at the center of every book whether they're in there or not is this blank space left by the author Mm. like everything in the books from their point of view no matter what character is speaking and so i always feel like you can see traces of an author and you the the early the older the book the more of the traces the author you see because you the more you know about that author's life it's hard to see traces of someone who's written two books in their books because you don't know about their life but someone who's dead and buried and the subject of scholarship and biographies you can see that stuff in their earlier books so yeah i've always been curious like you know once all these once all these living horror authors have died i want to see those definitive biographies and read them and then go back to their work yeah i think you know one it's funny you say that because i i 
one of the authors that fascinates me the most in that way, uh, who's and who's who's writing, I have um, not quite a love hate relationship, but I have mixed emotions about. It's Clive Barker. Oh sure. Um, you know, I love the books of blood. The damnation game is, you know, uh, one of my favorite books, uh, and all his early stuff. And then he sort of, you know, as he gets through the books get thicker and, they, you know, I can, could really do with an editor at times. Um, but he, like I say him, you know, uh, being openly gay, uh, and, you know, obviously sort of being incredibly sort of, uh, LGBTQ early on sort of, you know, LGBTQ kind of, uh, open and, so many of his characters are sort of um, um, you know, dealing with that. And even his films, I mean, uh, Cabal um, and obviously the, the Nightbreed film, um, you know, can be seen in that way. And someone, I think, sort of smarter and, and <clears throat> more educated than I will probably end up doing that. But I'd love to see someone go back and do that with all those books, with all his books, and say, yeah. like, you know, this is where he started and this is where he went. And this is clearly like how it mirrors his life and his art and that sort of thing. Yeah. And also, you know, Barker's been really sick. You know, he had, mm. I think, throat cancer or something. I mean, and, you know, that really changed his life. And how do you see that in his books? You know what I mean? I would love mm. and And I think for Barker, it's really interesting because Barker's an author I love, but I don't relate much to his later books. For me, it really, I mean, I hate to sound lame but it kind of stops at weave world for me yeah. um but books of blood and damnation game and weave world especially were such huge impacts on me and i love them so much and i still go back to books of blood from time to time and i'm just astonished by them they feel fresh now and they're from 19 freaking 86 yeah. um but i feel like for barker there's kind of a couple of things and one is that his paintings and his artwork is such a part of his self-expression and so it's like if you're going to look at his books, you sort of want to see his paintings he was doing at the same time, not because they illustrated the books, because they also give you an idea of where his life was at that time. Mm -hmm. And I think that's hard to do because he's so enormously productive and you don't see anywhere where you can see both in the same space. And the other thing is Barker is one of those, those authors. I think, you know, briefly Stephen King was at a certain point in his career. Anne Rice was at a certain point in her career. Neil Gaiman was at a certain point in his career where they, they sort of they sort of author their own identity for the press and for the public's consumption. I mean, you read all these interviews with Barker inviting people into his house and he has these skulls mounted on the wall and all this stuff. And, you know, you look at H.R. Giger, who did kind of the same thing, and you're like, this person is like, you know, they, they've, they're kind of creating a performance for the public to consume because this is who they want to be. And I think Barker did that really well for mm -hmm. a while. And, like... I think it's hard to pick through that and get to the person and especially being sick for so long. You know, you look at Stephen King's work before he was hit by that van and had to basically mm. have the whole lower half of his body put back together. And you look after, and I don't want to draw a one-to-one -one comparison, but the way he writes about pain in books like Dreamweaver and Duma Key is so different and so much more felt, and it feels so much more lived than it did before that van accident in his other books. Yeah, I think you know Stephen King's interesting in that sense. I mean, you know, just to um, round that out, really, is um, the Dark Tower series. Um, splits into two really because obviously he wrote those the first three books mm -hmm. the first three or four and then obviously took a huge break and then wrote the rest um and i've read those right, right. Wrote, i've read those several times and and the the story is continuous and it works and I, I really do i really do enjoy those books but yeah you can see a difference in person this you know the books are like there's a a much more mature and much more sort of lived in person as those, those final books uh compared to sort of especially you know you compare the gunslinger through to the final book just called dark tower then it's um uh, it's night and day so yeah that is and and you just say that i'm just looking at my bookshelf and i just think of others like uh, i also think of james herbert and i know you mentioned him in, in your book oh sure um you know his early books like Rat, the, uh, the Rats and the Fog and, and all those sorts. And then you get through to things like the Magic Cottage and um, yeah, the you know the the Secret of Secret of Crickley Hall. And they're just so different and such a different kind of book. Um, so yeah, I think that would be interesting to actually see the progression to do that and and see how their life has affected their um, their, their their art. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And, you know, King is also really interesting because there, you know, there's, there are all these sort of bits of received wisdom about King, like, oh, you know, his earlier books were better and everything. And I actually, you know, I don't know, man, I, you would have a hard time getting me to trade Duma Key or the girl who loved Tom Gordon or, um, Revival for another book. Like, I think those books are pretty amazing. And I think Revival, especially, it's an old man's book. It's a book written by an old guy whose friends have started dying and who feels like maybe he's closer to the end than the beginning. And the fact that from that point of view, he writes a book where you die and there's nothing except pain and labor and torture is such a bleak place to be. I mean, that's amazing to me. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. He does sort of, you know, he, he sort of. I think he, he almost knows at times when he's writing a book which ones are going to be his, um, what I would class, I suppose, is sort of the airport novels, and which ones he's got something he wants to say with, um, and, and they do sort of stand out. But yeah, the, some of his later books are fantastic. Yeah, and I think it's hard, right? Because when you're reading King as he comes out, you're like, well, this is the new King book, and I don't like it. King mm. sucks. He's all over. But then, like seven years later, well, you've got six more books after that one and you're like well that one wasn't mine but the next one was great and so was the one after that and then the next one wasn't for me so it's like it's really interesting to take him as a whole because i think it's easy to sort of have these knee-jerk reactions when you take his books one at a time as they come out yeah like you say sort of uh there's there's definitely i think the thing with king as well is because he's so prolific that they're not all going to be hits are they not all ideas are going to land and not all books are going to be um you know, like number one, uh, number one, or there will be number one, but they're not all amazing. But yeah. there, there is going to be one or two, like I say, that will crop up and they will be for you. You know, the next one may not, it may not be, like I say, it may not be for you, but it might be for me. Um, yeah. Like, okay. I remember when Tommy Knockers came out in 91, I think. I, mean, mm. I don't know when exactly. I, I hated that book. I was like, oh my God, this is the worst thing ever. This is crap. Um, now i love that book flaws and all i think it's an amazing book but when i was a kid the book i love was salem's lot i read that book over and over again and now i read it and i see a lot of shortcomings and things i really or not shortcomings but things i really don't like about the book that it just doesn't for me it doesn't hold up as a reader but as a kid i worshipped it and hated tommy knockers and now man I, that's completely flipped in my head mm. yeah it just happened doesn't it Right, yeah. we'll get we'll get back to the thing. So, um, yeah, sorry, sorry. No, no, it's all good because I can, I can use all of this. It's amazing. Uh, so, the, the next question then. So, we're talking about sort of uh, representation, but so can genre fiction be used to subvert social norms? Oh yeah, I mean, I think that's sort of what horror fiction does, right? I mean, horror is about someone dying at the dinner table or someone throwing up there's that abjection that uh, abjection right that that revulsion and and disgust with things that horror traffics in um i think it was like uh carl theodore dreyer the filmmaker said um you know you're sitting in a room and it's late afternoon and you know you hear a little piano music and the lights coming through just so and you're reading a book and now someone tells you behind that door there's a dead body mm. and everything's different. And I think that's what horror is. It's that dead body behind the door. It's this idea that, um, you know, everything is wrong. Um, and, and even things look good. It's only the calm before the storm or the storm's going on and you just haven't seen it yet. There was a great performer uh a duo kiki and herb uh kiki was a drag queen justin bond and um uh, justin came out of sort of like a lot of aids activism and punk rock stuff in san francisco and she was doing this performance once and this is only something i've heard from someone who was there and she's singing and doing all this stuff and she raises the window looking out on i think it was market street or somewhere and she leans out and screams don't get too comfortable. And I feel like that's horror. Horror is someone leaning out the window, screaming at a bunch of people, shopping and going to bars and restaurants. Don't get too comfortable. And so I think horror always does that, you know? 
Um, you can see it done overtly in books like Out for Blood by um, John Peyton Cook, I believe, you know, which is 91, which is sort of the first overtly gay vampire novel. Um, and, it, you know, that was sort of like AIDS was still, you know, a crisis. And um, and it's a book where they wouldn't let him have his main character be dying of AIDS. So he made him dying of leukemia. But you still have all this stuff about someone finding their community and finding healing and wholeness there and, and kind of okay, well, awesome. Like people just are cattle because I found my family and everyone else who rejected me, I'm just going to eat them from now on. And, you know, I think that's great. And you see things like that in Rosemary's Baby, uh, this fear of her husband, you know, the Stepford Wives by Mm. Ira Levin, Levin, you know, Mm. I mean, all this stuff, horror has always been doing that. I mean, you know, Henry James, the jolly corner about a guy who goes off to Europe and gets all sophisticated and he comes back and he has this dreadful encounter with the version of him who never left. I mean, that's so destabilizing on a psychological level, but it's also so destabilizing like on on a on a kind of political level because the one who went to Europe is, you know, he's an artist and he's he's cultured and refined, but the American version, if I remember correctly, is sort of a little grosser, a little more vulgar, a little more money grubbing. And how do these two versions of you collide? Um so yeah, I mean you know, vampires have always been associated with plagues, um, and and the vampire is a disease carrier. I mean, that's always been there. You know, Dracula's coming to England, and he says, "I'm going to make more just like me." Well, holy shit! Will they be able to vote? <laughs> will, they, will they take over the country? Like, what's going to happen? I mean, that's what Kim Newman does in Anno Dracula, right? Like, Dracula basically marries into the royal family and takes over England. Um, you know, it's it's this idea. There's always horror at the heart of every horror novel, even if it's a cozy ghost story. Is this destabilizing idea of death isn't dead? No, I like the idea of that the sort of the horror hidden just behind the door. Um... And it is as simple as that. I mean, I think you know, you, to think about um, you know some of the best, this most this, the simplest horror films. You know, even some of the, the those found footage ones where, <clears throat> when done really well, all they can do is show you an empty frame. It can just be a door frame, whatever, and you feel incredibly nervous because you sort of, you know, it feels like there's something wrong. There's just something there that you can't yeah. see. It goes back to that thing as well. Not like you said about not being able to identify something as a person it unnerves you because it just feels wrong um yeah well and also you know horror you can read a lot of the same things two ways because because so much of this stuff is sublimated and implied in horror you can really squint at it from different directions and hey that's you know um that's a white goblet or no it's the black silhouette of two old ladies looking at Mm. each other like you know so you look at something like the blair witch project and you can say oh that's very conservative right like not conservative like left wing right wing but that's very conservative there are places you know we should be able to go anywhere and do anything but actually there are places we shouldn't go we shouldn't ask these questions we shouldn't try to to hunt down these facts on the other hand, you look at it and you say, oh, I see, you know, this history of this, like, you know, misogyny and these women being murdered to be witches and all of that, that will come back to haunt us, this return of the repressed. And it will take, you know, it will, you know, like the angel of death in the Bible, it will, you know, kill our children, these sins we committed in the past against these women. So, you know, you can look at anything and see it two ways in horror because so much of the message is implicit, not explicit. No, I like that. That's good. Excellent. Okay, so we'll move into the final section. This is just, this is a genre fiction from childhood to adulthood. And the first question is, what introduced you to genre fiction? So I'm going to get the title wrong, but when I was a kid, we lived in England for about a year in Dulwich because my dad was working at a hospital over there and sort of like a sabbatical thing. And we rented this big drafty Victorian house and there was a book in their library like way up on this high shelf and it was this reader's digest book with a black cover and this sort of gold stamped mask on it i think it was called uh, legends and folklore of great britain um and that thing was lurid it was full of these wood cuts of like i think they were witches getting hung and you know catholics getting burned and people being tortured to death and ghosts and all this you know people hanging in gibbets and i loved it and i was like six and i just remember that like living in that year in england it was 
overcast. It was rainy. It was the 70s. Everyone was wearing brown corduroy. Every room was too cold. And everywhere we went, there was like Madame Tussauds. There was this crazy book. There were all these, you know, you'd go to see the great houses in the countryside. There'd be hidey holes for the priests. And then, of course, they'd have a little book you could buy in the gift shop for like 60p that was like, you know, and here's what they did to the priests when they found them. They drew and quartered them and pulled out their guts and burned them with hot pokers. Um, and here's some thumb screws. There was Stonehenge. There was, it was just this huge introduction to um, an idea that there were old things and things behind the wall sometimes literally that were really cool mm -hmm. and that's really where it started for me cool so it's really it was like the historical and the folklore thing that's quite cool um it, it's funny you say that especially because um you know the, the, the historical influence and and yeah, you're right. You know, Britain in particular, we're not particularly nice to certain people in a historical context. <laughs> it's just, it's just the way we are. Um, but it's really interesting that, that in this country, you know, um, we had the the video nasties, the sort of like the um, the uh, in ninety four the the act that sort of prevented them, and then there was the all the other things about certain books were banned and and or edited and whatever. But I've actually known people, and I, I still know people today that'll be like, "Oh, I wouldn't show, I won't show that to my kids," and you know, though that, that's violence, comics, games, whatever. And you go, "Okay, so where are you taking them this weekend?" Oh, well, we're going to go to Warwick Castle. I'm going to show them the dungeon. Yeah. And you're sort of like, well, isn't what? That, what? <laughs> isn't there that great quote from I think it's like Michael Palin when they were doing lo or Terry Gilliam or someone when they were doing location scouting for Monty Python and the Quest for the Holy Grail? And I think they had all these Scottish castles lined up, these national trust sites that they were going to shoot at. And like before they started shooting, um, they had all their locations yanked because the National Trust wrote them this letter. It was like, I, they would undermine the dignity of these locations. And they're like, what dignity? People were murdered here. Yeah. People poured boiling oil. People were tortured to death. And we're coming to make a few jokes. Like, what dignity are we undermining? And, you know, that's a love. And listen, the states are no different. But for me, like, um, England's always nice because I feel like I can wrap my head around it a little because I know just enough but not too much. Uh, the states I know too much. It's all a mess. Um <laughs> But England's so great because you had the whole... It was Mary Whitehead, right? With the video nasties and all that. Uh, Mary Whitehouse, um, yeah. Mary Whitehouse, yeah. Whitehouse, thank you. Um, and you had all that, and you had this whole idea of this sort of moral rectitude and all this, and this stiff upper lip and everything, and you're like, this is the country that murdered and tortured a lot of Catholics and <laughs> expelled the Jews, and basically everyone was killing each other for long periods of time here. Like... You yeah. know, and you're worried about Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah, it's it's but it's bizarre. I've actually got a, a book somewhere. And it's sort of um, it's a it's a book of all the letters and and some of the responses that she wrote to different things and some of the things that she boycotted and stuff. And and just you the sort of sorry, just that moral uh, pompousness. It just sort of it's it's hilarious at times. Some of the things she was objecting to. Well, it's interesting, too. I mean, I almost find it touching in a way when, when you you read interviews with her or articles she wrote or you even in the States during the Satanic Panic and even earlier, you feel like these people know that history is this big, bloody, shapeless tide and it will sweep everything away if you think about it too hard. I mean, if the United States really sat down and reckoned with you know what was done to native americans in this country and the fact that so much of this country is built on slavery and how inhumane that is if we really thought about it i think we'd go insane and you read these people with these sort of like outrage against a judas priest album or a movie and there's almost something touching in their desperation and their belief that they can hold back you know they can somehow hold back humanity's history of blood and pain and suffering and death by fixing this album by getting rid of this vhs tape it's yeah i think it's it's funny uh i think we have as just as humans we have a great knack of compartmentalizing things just to make it easier for ourselves um yeah uh take for example so we've just had um VE Day over here, Victory in Europe Day. Seventy-five years since sort of uh, you know the, the success of of defeating Nazi Germany. So there was a big thing, you know, obviously during the lockdown. So there was sort of like people were partying in their front gardens, and there was like bunting out the flags and all this other stuff. 
And I was, I was out and everyone was sort of celebrating. I thought, this is a celebration of not just Britain, but of, of Europe as, a, as, an, you know, as an army and as a group um, working together to defeat an enemy. That was, you know, very much sort of like, you know, this thing of how we helped survive Europe, you know, d- to defend Europe, not just ourselves, but Europe, you know, France and Austria and Germany and get them all back and Spain, all these things. Yet, we've just voted for Brexit. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, oh, it's so weird. It's so, you know, enormously contradictory. Yeah, and I couldn't, like, like I say, if you think about it too much, it does, it drives you nuts. And so... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it just it just makes me laugh that sort of people can do that. Because you you'll see them all celebrating and sort of waving the Union Jacks and, you know, oh, this is all about all those people that sort of, you know, died in World War Two, and they're thinking... Yeah, but you've just been touting how much you hate Europe. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I mean, you look at um, you look at people talking about in the states, you know, um, how oh, you know, uh, the Great Depression, and we came back, and we had that World War Two spirit, and we really came together, and all this. I'm like, that World War Two spirit was because we were defending our allies in Europe, something we've just walked back to a large extent over the last four years. You know, it's a bit like what you're saying, you know, that, you know, everyone during the coronavirus outbreak is talking about in the UK, I see it in the Guardian all the time, you know, the blitz spirit and the all that stuff. And it's like, we'll, we'll, you know, keep calm and carry on. And you're like, that was World War Two, like you're saying, like, that mm. was, we, we, we just sort of torched everything that made that possible. Yeah, that's it. It's it's, 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 yeah, people are just very, very bizarre. Like, you know, they don't really want to join the dots up because it sort of starts to highlight their own hypocrisy. Um, but anyway, final question. Um, so, do you think it is important to introduce children to horror and sci fi genre ideas? Well, I mean, I don't think anything's important when it comes to children except keeping them like warm, safe, and fed. Um, you know, I, I so I, I don't know if I'd agree with the word important. But I do know that, you know, this was stuff I wanted to consume as a kid. You couldn't have kept me away from it if you tried. And I feel that that's the same with most kids. They, if you say they can't have something, they will find it. I mean, I wasn't allowed to watch R-rated movies when I was a kid. And so what I did was uh, my, my Cub Scout troop and then Weeblos and then Boy Scouts, you know, we would go to this gas station to get snacks after every meeting. The Scoutmaster would take us over and we'd all have like, you know, two dollars or three dollars in our pocket from our parents and buy you know junk food and sugar and caffeine and all that stuff and i convinced them that i was allowed to buy magazines because magazines were books and they were really good for you and i'd always buy fangoria and then i'd pretend that i'd seen the movies i'd read about in fangoria because i looked at the photos i read the plot descriptions and it wasn't until a couple of years ago i sat down and i thought i was going to rewatch friday the 13th part two and realized I was watching it for the first time. I just said I had watched it so much growing up that I thought I'd watched it and I never had. I just read about it in Fango. <laughs> and so kids are just attracted to this. And um, I feel like if that's where they want to go, why would you stop them? There's nothing harmful here. Um, you know, there's nothing harmful in a ghost story. There's nothing harmful in a monster story. There's nothing harmful in um, a, a war story. It's how you tell it. And I just can't imagine having grown up without reading ghost stories. I mean, I had one of those books, you know, The World Guide to Ghost Stories. I read about ghosts in Argentina and China and Japan and Hawaii and England and America and France. And and I loved it. It was fascinating to me and not really scary in the slightest or where I grew up, it was like ghost stories were sort of what you did, you know, it was like a, it's an old town Charleston, and it was full of ghost stories, that was part of our identity, or reading Greek myths, or Norse myths, or even going to school and studying Shakespeare, I mean, you know, Jesus, Macbeth is bloody as (laughs) hell, you know, Um, so I just, I can't imagine telling a kid, don't read that, because it's not appropriate for you, Um, I I did, that just doesn't register for me. No, it's a good point, I like that. Um, yeah, but if especially if it's getting them to read and to do, th- you know, to explore and and to learn new things, and yeah, like I say, well, we just stop them, let them, let them learn, let them try new things. Yeah, well, you know, and one of the things that's interesting is I actually just had someone email me because they wanted me to say something because they 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 had a relative, a sister, I think, or maybe a brother who was 
really, really dictating to their kid, who I think was an 11 year old boy, what he should and shouldn't be reading. And she was like, I'm trying to convince my brother, I think, that you can read anything when you're that age and it's okay. And so I was like, oh yeah, this is what I read when I was an 11 year old boy. And what I read was 11 year old boy was deeply inappropriate. I mean, I was reading, starting to read Stephen King. I was reading fantasy novels that were way too old. I was reading tons of comic books. I had, you know, the anarchist cookbook. I loved military fiction and men's adventure stuff where people were just shooting people all the time. And what that did for me is it didn't turn me into a school shooter or serial killer. It turned me into someone who read and who read for fun and who knew that reading was fun. And that's sort of one of those tools I've had all my life that stood me in really good stead. Um, you know, it's, it's why I have an attention span. It's why I know anything worthwhile. And so I feel like I, I just don't comprehend telling someone not to read as a kid. I mean, I read the trashiest stuff, but that was because I was developing a love for reading because I was reading trashy stuff, the fun stuff. Yeah, yeah it's funny. I, I I totally agree with that because um, a, a lot of times, you know, I, I see um, you know uh, kids going to school and they're sort of really sort of pushing back against some of the stuff they're being given to read. You know, you got to read this textbook. You got to read. You got to learn reading this book. And a lot of times I'm like, you know, I hear parents or friends of ours really say, oh, they really, they just won't read this book. And I'm like, well, give them someone else then. You know, if they don't want to read yeah, that exactly. one, leave something else out. Like, there are still kids' books out there. What do they like? Oh, they really like this. Right, well, get them a book about that. Leave it out. Yeah. And they'll read that and, you know, it'll, it'll get them reading. I don't care if they're reading, like, a football magazine, like you say, Fangoria or... You know anything else? Like if if that's what they want to read, it's getting them to read. It's a it's a it's a, a foot in the door, isn't it? Really, because then you can say, well, if you enjoyed that, maybe you should try this, and you can sort of wean them onto it. Yeah, and you know, and there's something. I, and, you know, I feel like a lot of people who do read talk about reading as if it's this kind of understood good, right? Well, if your kid reads, that's all that matters. And, and you know, and it's funny. I once got in a fight at a party with someone who was saying, um, I've never read the Harry Potter books, nothing against them. I've seen all the movies. I just, I, it just wasn't my generation. Mm. And, um, but they were saying, oh, it's, I love the Harry Potter books. Because, you know, it gets kids to read and, um, you know, and it's so great because it's a really long book. And I was like, the Bible's a really long book. Mein Kampf is a really long book. I was just being a dick. (laughs) But but there there is this idea that I don't like where it's like kids should just read because. And I feel like, you know... It, it is incumbent on those of us who like reading, who's been who've been doing it all our lives, to sort of like like a fish describing water and being wet. We need to describe why reading is good. Mm-hmm. And I think you know the two, the three things that reading has really given me is one is focus and concentration. You know, I just I, I can sit down and do work. I can sit down and read. I can sit down and focus on something for long periods of time. And I think right now when there's so many. Um, things geared at breaking that that it's really important to to carve out that turf that's yours psychologically and psychically that's this is just me i can ignore my text alerts i can ignore my facebook alerts i can ignore all this noise because this is my space and i think that's really important i also think reading is one of those things that you have so much it has so much availability there are libraries everywhere there's the internet with so many books you can just find on pdf like going all the way back and it's a really really good way to get ideas it's a really really good way to find out about stuff and sort of educate yourself about stuff so instead of taking received wisdom you know what you're getting you know why x y and z you don't just accept x y and z and i think the other thing is There's something very passive. I love movies. I've watched movies all my life. I love them. But there is something passive about the movie-going experience. You are getting someone else's vision of the world injected right into your eyes. I love it. It's great to give yourself over to that. But I think reading hits this sweet spot where you're having to imagine it and form it inside your head, those images, even though you're getting this person's view of the world. And I think for some reason there's this sort of that hits this sweet spot of – I'm getting this injection of someone's point of view, 
but I'm actively engaging in it by imagining it and questioning it and interrogating it as I read. That, that makes reading really different from a lot of other things. So I'm sorry, I didn't mean to turn this into a PSA for reading. Just <laughs> that's where our conversation was going, and I felt the need to do it. I don't know why. I will shut up now. No, no, it's good, I, I, and I agree. I think one of the things, um, you know, um, I like about reading is, I say, it's you you are getting the, that author's uh, viewpoint of them, but you're also, as you sort of said, you know, you're, it's also informed by everything that you've gone through. So the voice of a character that I hear would be different from the voice of the character that you hear, and I may sort of interpret that character slightly different. Although we're reading the same book, I could still interpret that character and some of the events slightly differently just because of how I approach it and stuff. And I think that's sort of, um, yeah. I, I enjoy that. That you know that 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 can be the way, and it's quite funny as well that when you, um, you, know, you do end up seeing these sort of like talk about films as well, sort of um, watching a, a book turned into a film, um, and you finally get to see sort of you know someone else. You do see some someone else's vision, and I don't think I've ever seen a film where I've gone, you know, well that that's not my so and so, you know. Right. Um, I, I usually go, oh that's interesting. You know, uh, that, that, yeah, I saw that. I didn't think of that though. And I can sort of see it, you know, sort of that's clearly somebody else's vision of that character or that scenario or that situation. Um, yeah, and you know, one of the things I love about fan culture is, you know, listen, everyone's into like the same TV show or the same movie. And, and it's a very passive experience receiving that movie or receiving that TV show. But where I find fan culture so great is then people debate it and make art based on it and interpret it differently. Nothing is less satisfying than meeting someone who's like, oh, yeah, I love that movie too. And you're like, you know, they see the same movie you do and you say, what do you think of it? And they go, it was all right. It was good. <laughs> and they have nothing else to say. <laughs> like if people see something I love, I want to hear their totally different point of view about it. I want to argue with them about it. I want to debate them about it. I wanted them to make me think about it in a way I hadn't thought about before. I want to see them draw the characters and, see their image of it be so different from mine. And I think that's what's so great about fan culture is it's, it's yes, okay, a bunch of people love Steven Universe and they sit there and they watch Steven Universe and then they buy a t-shirt, fine. But they engage in it. They make art about it. They make up games. They dress as the characters and reinterpret the characters according to how they look. They debate the episodes. They read stuff into it. And that's what's so cool. Fan culture actually redeems pop culture, I think, these days in a lot of ways. Do you know I really like that. I've re- yeah, because especially because fan culture gets a real bashing as well these days. And you know there right. are, there, are, there are bad eggs out there. You know, sort of like that. You know, if you like DC, well, then you're bad because we like Marvel. And if you like Marvel, well, you're bad because we like DC. Or, or start, you know, I like The Last Jedi. Well, I like The Rise of Skywalker. You know, it's, right. it's, it's, it's I almost want to try and go, it's all good. <laughs> Just like it. I don't care. You know. I mean, even even the most reprehensible piece of pop culture, like the recent movie Cats, <laughs> um, to me, that's totally redeemed by all the memes, all the gifts, by the yeah. butthole trailer, <laughs> by all the stuff people did to use that as, as fuel for their own personal creative rocket ship. That redeems it. Yes. Yeah, it's interesting. Mostly. It's, it's, mostly. mostly. I haven't seen, I don't think I will, but yeah, I, I know what you mean. It's interesting, to, I'll just sort of, uh, final note really, but... Um, one for one of the podcasts I do, uh, uh, we do. I'm doing like a sci-fi movie review called Stories Out of Times and Space, and um, we're actually doing a deep dive into Red Dwarf, which is a um, a British. Oh yeah, I know, I know Red Dwarf. Sure. Okay, well I hope you might enjoy the show. Um, but we we sort of uh, Julian and I, sort of my co-host, were very much like, oh okay, well you know the episodes will be, you know, won't be particularly long, and there'll be a couple. When we get to seasons, we're not fans of, you know, they'll probably be quite short. And we did recently, or last last Sunday, actually, we got to uh, do. Um, uh, seasons uh, seven and eight, which is sort of the last of the BBC ones, and you know, uh, leading up to it, we were both like, okay, well, that one's going to be an hour long because we're not, you know, keen on them. We know they're not great. We'll we'll go into it. Four hours that one. Yeah. Um, well, you know, it's always interesting to it's always more interesting to talk about stuff with someone that you don't love mm. because when you love something, sometimes it's not as it's harder to analyze. Mm. Yeah, it was. It was great. I mean, the whole thing's been fun because it's sort of. I've, I've now got. An, I'm going through it all again. I mean, you know, I watch it on and off for years and years. But like, we've we've done like a real like psychoanalyzing of sort of the, oh, Dave Lister. You know, he's obviously the main character. He's the last human alive. It's all about him. 
coming back to it now, I'm like, no, no, Rimmer is <laughs> totally the main character and the best actor, and he has all the best episodes. Um, right. And so it's, it's been really interesting. So yeah, it's just too, like, let's say, again, like you said, coming, coming back to things at a different age, you get to appreciate them in a different way. But also coming back no, as, exactly. as, as a fandom, I, I, you know, it's just great to talk about it and deep dive on it and, and take it apart, even the stuff that isn't great, but still enjoy it because I love the whole. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I mean, that's, uh, that's, that's, I think fandom's amazing. And look, I know there's bad parts of fandom, but there's bad parts of everything. There's no one's ever liked bullies and pedants, mm. you know, and when they appear in fandom, they suck too. Yeah. <laughs> it's very, very true. Well, anyway, that that's all my questions, and uh, you know, it's been cool. uh, it's been a bit longer than intended, but it's been really good talking to you again, Gray. So I really appreciate your time. Well, what an interview! I really enjoyed talking to Grady, and I hope you enjoyed listening to it. Um, really insightful, knows his stuff, and uh, he also hooked me up with some uh, excellent other interviewers. So they'll be coming in the next episode, actually. They'll just give you a heads up. The next episode is going to be a triple header. It's going to be three interviews. Uh, David Moody, who uh, has done some excellent books, been on the show before. Uh, Paul Tremblay, who is also uh, an author, uh, wrote uh, another Possession book and several others. Uh, so I'll talk about more in the show. And also Lisa Kroger, uh, another fiction writer. And also someone with some insight into... Uh, <laughs> Well, the CIA, weirdly, uh, we have some interesting conversations with her. So both of those, or say all three of those, will be in the next episode. That's the end of the interviews. Um, I did have one with Peter Laws, who I love talking to. Excellent uh, uh, guy, Peter Laws. Unfortunately, the, the file seems to have corrupted and I've lost that. So that's a real tragedy. Uh, but anyway, thank you for listening, as always. I, you know I appreciate everyone who does. Uh, but if you want to support the podcast... We do have a Patreon, and we love our Patreon patrons. Uh, we do things on there. We have a podcast called 30 Minute Thoughts, in which every month I give my thoughts on a subject for 30 minutes. Um, we've done all kinds of things. And this month, to celebrate the passing of Sean Connery, I will be giving my thoughts uh, on Goldfinger. Uh, the, the Bond film Goldfinger. Uh, in addition to that, every quarter we have started to do, uh, we call it Creator Corner. And on Creators Corner, uh, I get a creator to come on to talk about a specific piece of work that they are doing, a part of something they are working on. The most recent one that's just gone up live was an interview, which is a video and an audio, uh, of me talking with Kieran Gillen uh, about his work on Once and Future, the comic series he's doing with Boom, which is awesome. I'm really loving it. Dan Mora on art. On art. Excellent book. Highly recommend it. So we do a lot of things, but also you get to vote on the topics that I talk about. And also, if you at the top tier, you get to vote on a topic that I get to talk about on this podcast every quarter. So that'll be going up soon. Uh, so if you do, check it out. Check our Patreon. There'll be links uh, below, uh, as always. Uh, but more than that, we have an Amazon wish list uh, if you want to sort of do that and give us something for Christmas. We love secondhand books. They are all there. I'm not saying you have to. Uh, but the other one, of course, is just leave a review. If you like the show, go on to your podcast catcher and just leave a review. Five stars, three stars, two stars, one stars. I don't care. Just go and leave a review. It's really appreciated. Okay, guys, thank you very much for listening and uh, we shall be back in two weeks' time. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>